gonna get hurt. Somebody's gonna get hurt. Alright guys, I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I never just did leave. Just just you never did leave. Just to confirm. The other one I click off is Let me share with you very quickly just a couple things about a couple classes. First of all, we're starting a new one tonight at 6 o'clock down in the Fellowship Hall. It's called Reopening Christianity. Pam Darnold and Jason and Emily Lee Hunley are going to be the facilitators. And over the next five weeks, they're going to deal with these five questions. And you ought to be a part of that. They're going to deal with, am I moving forward or going backwards? Am I a consumer or a contributor? Am I playing offense or defense? Am I known for what I am for or what I'm against? And finally, am I willing to follow Jesus as my Lord? And so it's gonna be a great series. They'll do a great job facilitating. It'll start at six o'clock. We have some uh, study guides if you're interested in that. Then on Wednesday nights, we have two groups going on. We have uh, Invisible War, which Amy and Belinda teach down in the encouragers room. And I would encourage you to go uh, join that one if you're interested in spiritual warfare and how Satan battles and how to fight that. And then Steve is doing an awesome job. He and Kathy will be tag teaming it up here on this one called The Real Heaven. We had good crowds in both classes Wednesday night. I would encourage you to come and be a part of those classes at 6 o'clock. Mike Todorovic will be in here tonight preaching. He's not going to make put me on the spot today. And so I appreciate that, Mike. And then Wednesday night, meals at 5 o'clock. It's chicken casserole this week. Well, good morning. Good morning. Did anyone swim in here today? Anybody building an ark? Skiing? Whatever you want to do, we've had the weather, haven't we? It's been uh, all kinds of craziness, but uh, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. How about you? Amen. It's a good place to be. Amen. Let's uh, worship together this morning. Let's stand and uh, let's join in singing. Every kid 
Praise the Lord. You may be seated.
Isn't that beautiful? Amen. 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 Then shall I live because of Christ. We invite him in to join us today, don't we? As we come together to worship, I pray that you will just uh, let all of the craziness of this past week and uh, even the past few days just slip away. And let's invite the Lord to come in, the Holy Spirit to come and fall fresh on us today.
that's not a prayer of my heart that I need him more I want to say thank you for praying for me this week it was a little bit under the weather I was kind enough to share it with Susan so uh, she's home with the same thing that I had so pray for pray for her and then uh, many who are uh, battling (coughs) flu and viruses and so much stuff going around But none of it comes as a surprise to the Lord. He's aware of it. And he understands it. I'm going to ask Missy Caston to come. She's going to represent her mom. Her mom's been in the hospital a few days. She went in with pneumonia and a COPD flare-up. And uh, then they received news that uh, something uh, strange showed up on the uh, EKG. And uh, her heart function had been at 40%. They're telling them it's at 30% now. And uh, they're going to do a heart cath. And uh, it's a scary time in the life of family members. And uh, we want to pray for Gail, Gail Bennett. Uh, she, is a, she loves this church and uh, she, uh, she loves the Lord. Uh, so maybe you want to come and uh, pray with with us as we anoint Missy on her her behalf and uh, we're going to sing just that chorus again because we need him Gail needs him right now those who are battling uh, the virus needs him now more than ever and uh, we're just going to believe that God is in control he's going to help and work in these situations and we want to uh, just pray for for her. Pray for Gail. Let's sing that chorus, could we? I need you more more than yesterday I need you more more than words can say I need you Father God, we come to you this morning thanking you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, we realize there are no surprises with you. You understand all the details of our lives, of our bodies. And this morning, Lord, we come especially for Gail Bennett. Lord, you gave her a good night's rest, and we praise you for that. And Father, they're looking at uh, doing a heart cath tomorrow. And we may not understand why or what's going on, but God, I just pray that you would give a a peace to Missy and Annalise and Sean and 
and uh, Gail at this time in their lives. They need you more today than they did yesterday. And they'll need you more tomorrow and the days ahead. And I just pray, Lord, that your touch would be upon Gail. I pray, Lord, that you would help in healing, in the, the healing process of, of pneumonia and uh, dealing with the COPD and, and whatever else is showing up, Lord, you, you know. And, Lord, we're believing your touch to be upon her. But, Lord, we pray for your will to be accomplished, for your will to be done. And may it be so. And Father, we think of those who are also battling sickness and, and uh, viruses. And we pray, Lord, that you would just draw close to those today. Whether they're at home or wherever they may be, that you would just uh, wrap your loving arms around them. And Lord, I just pray that Missy and Gail and those who are at home ill, Lord, that... Uh, they would sense your presence every step that they take, every moment of their lives. And I pray, Father, today that you would open our hearts, that you would open our ears today that we might hear from you. Help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us, Lord, to love you above all things. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us for answering the cries of our hearts. These things we pray in your holy and your wonderful name. Amen. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you God's been kicking my butt for the past two or three weeks to tell me to say something, say something, but well, no, me, stubborn as I am. Amen. <laughs> it's been a blessed first part of the year. It was a, for me personally, it was not such a blessed last part of the year. I lost a good friend. And I got mad at God for taking him. Brother Gary meant a lot to me. I wish I'd learned some of these tricks in the kitchen, but he wouldn't share. And I may see him every day, but I know that I'll see him again someday because I know where he's at. Gary opened up to us right before he went to the hospital a week or so and gave his testimony. And I wish you all could have heard it. Because that was beautiful. When Gary was saved, Jackie, 30 years ago, roughly, he left everything right here at the altar. He was a sailor, so you know how that went. He never cussed again. He never fought again. He gave it all. And if there's someone here this morning that needs to give that all, I invite you to do it. Because I don't want you to miss what Gary has now, what my dad has, my mom, my grandparents. Because I'm looking forward to it someday. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His 
again
and there'll be no no sorrow there and no more burdens to bear no more sickness and no more pain and no more parting over there and for forever i will be yes with the one the one who died just for me what a day a glorious day that will be stand and sing it from your hearts what a day that will be oh when my jesus i shall see and when i look look upon his face he's the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land what a day glorious day that will be give him praise this morning amen 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 praise the lord praise the lord God is good. Yes. eternity in hell if you know him like I know him I can't imagine I think about Christmas always brings a lot of memories back to my dad my dad was a shouter my dad weighed at one time 275 pounds it was like 6'1 he was a tank and actually he's Craig's built a lot like him and um, but I always think a lot of my dad and you know, as big as man as my dad was, he was not afraid to come into a church and praise the Lord. He was not afraid to shed a tear. 
I don't care if he'd never been to your church before. If God put a shout on him, my dad shouted, and you just better move out of the way because he's going to run over you. And I thought to myself, what happened? God didn't change. We changed. And I looked over here at Elizabeth, and I told her sometimes I'm going to move over there on that shouting pew because that's where it comes from the most. But you know what? God's real, folks. He's still answering prayers. He is still saving. And even though we don't understand all of this sickness and all of this death, you know, it's just temporary. Because Jesus Christ is coming back, and I believe it's not going to be long. And I want to hear him say, enter in, my good and faithful servant. You fought a good fight. You kept the faith. And it's only through his blood shed that I am able to do that. I praise him, and I tell you, I think I almost scared myself over here shouting because I don't very seldom do that. But it is going to be what a day when my Jesus I shall see face to face. And you know, we're not going to care about all this COVID crap. We're not going to think a thing about it. We're not going to think about strokes, flus. We're going to be praising him. So you know what? Get practice up this morning. Start praising him this morning because I'm telling you, if you don't like shouting, you better be at the far end of another cloud because I'm going to shout and I'm going to give Jesus Christ praise and I'm going to hug his neck and I'm going to thank him for what he has done for me. I still have my mom. My mom's getting ready to turn 84. I'm so thankful she can't do anything, but I got to go yesterday. I got to hold her. That means so much to me. She laid her little head on my shoulder. She said, I think I could just go to sleep right here. You know, if you have your loved ones this morning, tell them you love them. I tell everybody I love them. I don't care who they are. They look at me like I'm strange, but I don't care. I want them to know God's love lives through me as it should live through you. Don't get upset when the lines are long. Don't get upset when you go to a restaurant and you're sitting there and you don't get your meal for 45 minutes. Use that opportunity to talk about Jesus Christ. Use that time to let them know, hey, I'm not in no hurry. God's blessing me. We're sitting here and we're just going to enjoy each other. That's what we did yesterday, didn't we, baby? Just sat there and enjoyed that steak 45 minutes long, but we sat there and enjoyed every moment that God had given us. So you know what? I love him. I want to praise him. And my goal in 22 is to be renewed to be stronger, to be more of a witness. I want to pray more for people. I love to pray. Oh, how I love to pray for people. I love when God puts that desire in my heart and he tells you to pray because sometimes that person's faith might be weak and it might be your faith that needs to carry them through. So I'm asking Keep praying for my little granddaughter, Leanne. Put it on your refrigerator. She really needs a touch. When you sit there and your little child becomes so lifeless and they can't open their eyes and look, it's scary. But you pray for her. I know this is going to be on TV and I don't care, but my son-in-law needs Jesus Christ. It's better that I embarrass him now than he gets embarrassed when Christ comes back. I want to see my son-in-law saved. And I'm going to say his name right down, Justin Spencer. He needs the Lord. You know what? If we're afraid to say their name, why are we going to even pray? You know, call it out. I think God wants us to call things out at times, don't you? A special need. I, I know he knows it all. I know he's got it all in control. But he tests us sometimes to see how much of a desire we have to see somebody saved. So you know what? Church, it's 22. Let's get renewed. Amen. 22, get renewed. That sounds pretty good. We just need to bask in the presence of the Lord and be faithful to him. There goes Tank across the... <laughs> 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 Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Love you, Pastor Craig. We almost dressed completely alike this morning. I've been growing my beard just as long as he's been growing his. So, uh, 
But isn't it good to love the Lord and enjoy being in the presence of friends and family and in His presence? It's a privilege. And uh, if you're not here this morning and not able to be here, you're missing something. Because you can't feel what we feel through the internet. You understand something's going on, but God's presence is real. And uh, I'd encourage you to be a part. Joe made all the necessary uh, announcements and uh, things that are happening all around us. And we just want to uh, continue to be faithful to the Lord in all that we do, in all that we do. Turn your hearts to Kim. Sunday? No. Well, we get what we get, right? We have what we have. That's always what I think. I wake up in the morning, I look out the window and say, yeah, it's going to rain. And uh, just leave it at that. And uh, we've had a, a mixture of everything this week. And uh, thanks to uh, all those who have helped around the church and getting things uh, taken care of. And, uh, but we've been looking at the foundation, and what we've heard testimony of today is the fact that Christ is our sure foundation, our foundation in what we believe and who we are as a church. Our theme verse for this series has been found in Joshua chapter 4, verses 21 through 22, and I hope 
before this is over that you get it ingrained in your mind. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descenders, descendants ask your parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. It is a testimony to who God is. So, Debbie, when someone asks you how your granddaughter is, you tell them, well, we prayed the other night and her fever came down to 100 and give God the glory. That's the point. You don't forget what God has done in your lives, and that's what Joshua was trying to enforce. We've talked the past two weeks about the foundation stones not only in our own lives, but in the life of the church of oneness or unity, being of one mind, of one spirit. Last week, we talked about being obedient, obedient to the truth that is in Scripture, Obedient through salvation of receiving Jesus into our heart. Obedience through baptism and through holiness of heart. Obedience as we walk in this life. And then we're reminded in Ephesians that built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, those who have gone before us with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone we have to keep things in perspective we have to understand the importance of those who have gone before us to help us in establishing where we are today as a body of believers and as a church now today i want us to look at the foundation stone of oversight now you may say pastor but when i think of oversight i think of um, oh i forgot to do that uh, it was an oversight that I didn't get that uh, grocery put in your bag that was supposed to be there. That's not the definition that I'm looking for. I'm looking at an oversight having overseeing what God has given to us. We have oversight of many things, or in the traditional church setting, it would be known as stewardship. We have stewardship over the things which God has given to us. When you begin to think of stewardship, it means uh, such as an employee that manages a household, an agent or a treasurer, someone who has oversight of many things. They make decisions. They make choices. And when the Bible refers to us as stewards, it's talking about the fact that God owns everything. Thank you, Kevin. God owns it all. There's nothing that we have that we can lay claim to. He's given us the strength to work. He's given us the abilities that we have. And God owns everything. And he gives us certain things in each of our lives to manage for his glory. Not for our glory, but for his glory. I think one of the most important things that we have to realize is that it's important that we are faithful in our stewardship. In every aspect of our lives that we are faithful. 1 Corinthians 4.2 tells us, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. You must prove faithful. Faithful. It takes a determination. It comes to a place where you will be faithful no matter what happens around you. You choose. It is a choice. God gives us gifts to manage for the good of the church and for our own lives. First Peter tells us about that. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. It's not to be self-serving. Our gifts, our talents, our abilities are not to make ourselves look good. Jesus said that he came not to be served 
but to serve. You can't understand oversight unless we understand the full concept of God's ownership. In Psalm, in talking about God, it says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. It's saying we have to get the full concept that God is God. We aren't. We have little control as a steward, as someone who's responsible. We have five areas that I want us to look at quickly this morning of oversight or stewardship. That means that God owns everything in these areas, but he allows us to manage them and to make the decisions. God doesn't force his decisions on us. He gives us the ability to make choices and decisions on our own, to manage what God has placed in our lives. That's a pretty awesome responsibility. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. The very first stone of oversight would be that of talent. Gifts and talents. We all have at least one gift. Some may have more. In Matthew chapter 25, he gives the example. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his way. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're, we're, talking about, we're talking about eight bags. Why didn't he just split it into three parts? That wasn't fair. Isn't, isn't that what we're taught today? It, it isn't fair. Everybody should get an equal share. But understand that the master, the owner, was doing what was best. For what he had. For he knew the skills and he knew the abilities. He knew the experience and he knew what each individual had the ability to handle. And he gave accordingly. You see, the master delivered to the servant his goods. It doesn't say that he gave it to them. It says he delivered it to them and they were being entrusted to care for those bags of gold while he was on his journey. And each one, the scripture said, was given, given to them according to their ability. We all have different gifts and abilities. We all have different talents that can be used. But you see, the servants were not expected to match someone else's accomplishments. They were only going to be judged on the faithfulness for what they had. It wasn't about whether or not that I can double mine or you can double yours or that, that uh, my increase will be more than your increase. It was they were to be faithful for what that had been assigned to them. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48, understand our responsibility with our talents, with our abilities. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. For everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. What is it saying? I believe that it's saying that when God reveals things to us, when God shows us in our talents and our abilities and and the way that we can serve, we have a responsibility to do that. And if I have great talents or great abilities, there is much more responsibility on me to use them even more. 
You see, it's not all equal. It's according to what we have. Now, what, what the tendency is then is then we sit back and we say, oh, I don't have any gifts, I don't have any talents, I can't do anything. Some of us, uh, some in here are good cooks. And some think they're good cooks. Yeah, you'll get it. You see, there are gifts and talents that we have. And we can use those gifts and talents to serve others and serve the church. They're all not alike. Everyone doesn't have to be a singer. Everyone doesn't have to be a, an instrumentalist. Everyone doesn't have to be a Sunday school teacher. But it takes all of us to make the kingdom of God to be fulfilled. And we can't be jealous of someone else's talents. We must come to the place of examining in ourselves and saying to ourselves, this is how God has gifted me. And I'm going to use it for his glory, for him. Scripture tells us in 1 Timothy not to neglect your gift. If you have a gift, he's saying that we must use that gift to glorify God. Whatever it is. You say, well, I, I don't know how, how sowing could glorify God. Check with Nancy Strickland. She'll tell you how it can glorify God. I don't know how what I do could ever... There's a way. Some of you are just good at loving people and comforting people. And being there for people, that's a gift. Satan tries to defeat us in, in our gifting and say, well, that's nothing. Everybody can do that. It's not true. You have been gifted and are a gift from God. And here's the greatest statement that we want to hear. Debbie alluded to it in Matthew. Well done. Good and faithful servant, you've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in the master's happiness. What greater words could you ever hear? Come and share in your master's happiness, for you have been faithful in a few things. The second thing that I believe, and you probably will never hear this in a stewardship message, is that we have a responsibility with our testimony. Everyone who has received Jesus Christ into your heart and forgiveness of your sins, you have a testimony. There is something that has occurred in your life where your sins have been forgiven and your life has been transformed. And so it tells us in 2 Timothy 1.8, it says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Do not be ashamed of the testimony. So many times we begin to cower in the background when, when they begin talking about things or, or things of the Lord and, and, and we don't speak up and we don't say, let me tell you what God has done for me. In Revelation it says, and it speaks of the testimony, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They were willing to stand for their testimony even to the point of death. Where are you? Are you there? There's something powerful about a personal testimony. There's something important about how God changed your life, where you were, Jeff, Related that in the small group that, that Gary shared of, of his salvation story. We need to share with one another how God changed and transformed our lives. What we were 
and now what we have become and what we could have been had God not intervened and we accepted his loving grace. As you go through the Bible, David said, Come and listen, and I will tell you what God has done for me. What a great start to a conversation that you're having with someone. Hey, let me tell you what God's done for me. Have you used that? Or, or do we say, Lord, make an opportunity that I can share Let me tell you what God's done for me. Has he done anything for you? Has he done anything even this week for you? David said, come and listen. Let me tell you about my God. The woman at the well, her testimony, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in Jesus because of her testimony of what Jesus had done in her life. The man born blind says this, I don't know whether he is good or bad, but this I know. I was blind, but now I see. I think we could say that. I was blind, but now I see. Peter and John, we cannot stop telling about the wonderful things we have seen and heard. It should burn on our hearts to tell others what Jesus is doing and has done in our lives. On six different occasions, Paul used his personal testimony to share the good news with unbelievers. It's not about just sharing your testimony in, in church. We love to hear him. We love to encourage each other. It's a good practice place. But the truth is we take that testimony out into the world to those who need to hear about Jesus. Jesus said, I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. We give witness to what we know and what we have experienced. You say, well, pastor, what's really the value of a testimony? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's unique to you. Nobody else has your testimony. It's personal, and it's easy to understand. You're the authority, and you speak with authority, and it's difficult to argue against what you have personally experienced. People love a personal story. People can relate to it. Begins to build relationships. In a skeptical world, it is the most effective witness to the lost. Your story. What God has done in your life. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, revere the Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. Oh, well, it's nothing. Oh, you know, I just, I just smile a lot. Take the opportunity. We pray, Lord, send somebody into my path and then we let them pass right by without giving our testimony hope to them. First Peter tells us who we are, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Don't let the world tell you that you are nothing. You are God's special possession that you have declared praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. What a testimony. God gave me and entrusted me with my testimony, and I have that responsibility to share it with others. The important fact is as well to guard your testimony. When you walk through life, your testimony is on display. 
once you have proclaimed yourself to be a child of God, guard your testimony with your actions and behaviors. The third thing that I want us to look at is the temple. This old body. All 275 pounds of it. Your mother said that too. Um, <clears throat> but um, 1 Corinthians tells us about our physical bodies. The importance of it. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Don't you know that this body is a temple of the Lord and the Holy Spirit dwells within us? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. The importance of the temple. We have been entrusted with this body. Now, now we begin preaching, preaching to the choir. You know, it becomes easy. It becomes easy to look at this temple. And it becomes easy for us to say, well, you know, I'm being a good steward of my body. You know, I, I don't do drugs. Um, I, I don't do alcohol. I don't do tobacco. I don't do, and we make the list of all the things that we don't do, and we hold our head up high, and we say, well, I'm doing good for God's temple. God bless me. But I believe what it says to us is that our body is God's temple, so therefore, preaching to the choir, you have heart disease, you should do something in taking care of God's temple. You have diabetes. You should not do things contrary to taking care of the body. You see, it's, it's easy to point fingers at the things that don't affect us. But can I say that even overeating is a, is a problem for the body? I'm looking at the experience there. But it is important that we understand you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with our bodies. It's not easy to do. It's not something that we want to talk about because it steps on our toes. We like to number all the things that we don't do. And then stick our chest out proud of how good we are. Ask the Lord, are you honoring him with your body that you've been entrusted to? Second Corinthians says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Well, you knew this one had to come into a stewardship message somewhere, didn't you? Treasure. What is ours? Do you realize that the Bible speaks more about giving and money than it does of heaven and hell? Over half of Jesus' parables that he told have to do with the subject of money. There are more promises in the Bible related to giving than any other subject. Your giving, giving of yourself, giving of your treasure is very important to God and it becomes a spiritual issue. Second Corinthians says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. 
You, do you see what it's saying? It's saying, oh, you do all of these things so well in your speech, in your knowledge, in your earnestness, in your faith. And, and then he had to throw that in there. Also excel in your faithfulness in giving. What does that mean? What it means is, that it's not my house, it's not my car, it's not my church, it's not my bank account. It all belongs to him. When we come to the understanding and we come to the place of realizing that we have only been entrusted with the treasures that we have, anything of value, God has entrusted that to us to manage for the good of his kingdom. When I'm a good steward of my treasure, my giving becomes an investment in eternity. Do you hear me? When I am a good steward of what I possess, my giving becomes an investment into eternity because it affects the lives of others. First Timothy says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they have laid up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Understanding my hands off of my life's treasures. And Lord, if you need it, you can have it. Now, some believe that uh, the tithe is Old Testament, and it was found in the Old Testament a tenth, bring your first fruits. But I really don't find anywhere in the New Testament that it negates the law of the Old Testament. That's up to you and God. But I can say that if you want to do New Testament living in the New Testament church, I believe when they first gathered together and when men came to Jesus and wanted to follow him, he said, sell everything that you have and come and follow me. Come with nothing. He's saying, it doesn't belong to you anyway. But I'm saying that it's important that we know the foundation that we are laying down. It's, it's not the dollar amount. It's not about five bags of gold or one bag of gold. It's about a heart that is in tune with God that if he says to give, we give abundantly. I do believe firmly we don't give just of excess. That's cheating. I never have enough. How about you? It seems like the money w runs out before all the bills get paid. But I found that God is faithful when I am faithful in seeing that things are taken care of. So why should I give? Why should I tithe? I believe it's important that we tithe because... God desires for the church to flourish. And it's a way that the church was organized so that we can become an impact in the community and on others. Tithe, giving what we have. If you follow church history, if you were to follow the history of this church, Jackie Ward and I were looking at a 25th um, anniversary edition of the, the district, the West Virginia district. And nearly every church 
They were formed in such and such year. Several of the members mortgaged their properties to see that the church would be built. Nobody forced them to. But I believe that God laid on the hearts of specific ones to say, I've got to be a part of this. And God blessed in those measures. So the question is, what does God want you to do with what you have? He doesn't call us to be paupers. He doesn't call us to to live as, as poor people. He loves us. It's all in priority of how we view what we have. Is it mine or is it available to him? Finally, in closing this morning, it always comes down to time. We read the scripture, make use of every opportunity. And it hasn't changed since it was written, the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In order to understand what the Lord's will is, we must set priority in spending time with God in our daily schedule. Not just if I have time. It becomes a central and important part of our day. Even Jesus understood that, for it said very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. He needed time alone with the Father. It should set an example for us. Jeremiah says, does a young woman forget her jewelry, a bride, her wedding ornaments? Yet my people have forgotten me. Days without number. Help us, Lord. I believe that we live in a society that says, my people have forgotten me. Days without number. And the psalmist said, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That wisdom comes from being in the presence of God. So we are to be stewards. We are to have oversight of these things as a foundation of our lives and of of the church. It's been entrusted to us. And we need to be prepared and follow through and be faithful. Because here's the message. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You say, well, pastor, why, why do you say that? Because of these five areas that we've talked about this morning, of these five areas, that thief wants to steal our faithfulness in those areas. He wants to kill our spirit and destroy us from what God has entrusted to us so that we won't be faithful. Scripture also says, for if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ, the promise of God. What are you doing with what you have been entrusted with? Are you being a faithful steward? Sometimes we say, oh, well, it's easy to be uh, uh, faithful with with." with a a certain one. We may even say it's easy just to, to be able to give. Then we feel good about ourselves. 
But I believe the Lord calls us to be good stewards of all he has entrusted to us from our talents, our abilities, from our time, from our testimony. So the question I ask us in closing, have we been faithful? Are we taking advantage of what we have been entrusted? And are we faithfully fulfilling where he is calling us and what he is asking us? Would you bow your heads? Foundation stones. If we want to live for the Lord, if we want him to have our best, last week I talked about obedience and that we need to walk in obedience and we need to ask him to search our hearts and point out any ways that are not pleasing to him. So today I, I'm asking us, how are you handling what God has entrusted to you? Are you being faithful? Or are you holding on to things, not letting go? I'm going to ask Kelly to sing with your heads bowed. Maybe you want to find a place of prayer this morning. I'd invite you to do so. Would you search your heart? Would you evaluate how you are doing with what God has entrusted Father, we come into your presence and realize, Lord, that sometimes it's difficult. When we begin to talk about things that may hit close to home, whether it's our body being a temple, whether it's about our treasures and what you have allowed us to have in our lives to manage, or Lord, whether it's even about our time and taking the time to experience you. Help us, Lord, to understand that you've entrusted us with a testimony of your salvation. And we have the responsibility to share that. Help us, Lord, that we too will hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Examine our hearts. Cause us to make course corrections. And may we be found faithful in all that we do. These things we pray. In the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.